in my hand the divinely inspired Word of God. And I want to hide God's Word in my heart that I might not sin against Him. In Christ's name. Amen. We have been studying the judgments in the Bible. There are many of them. I've taken out five of them in particular because it will give you kind of a broad picture of the judgments in the Word of God. To the believer, the judgment is one thing. To the unbeliever, it's another. But there are many judgments in the Word of God. The ones that I've chosen is, number one, believers, sin, and judgment. And how that you and I, as believers in Christ, when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. You better lay hold of this truth because you're going to need it before the day is through. Uh, you're going to fail God. You're going to, it's not a mistake. It's sin will happen within your life. What do you do as a Christian? I'm going to give you a very simple, simple truth that I've used and exercised most of my Christian life. And I've taken a very familiar verse of Scripture in the book of John. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin... He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, some people use that as a scapegoat to do anything they want to do. But to those who are walking with God and sincerely want to walk with the Lord and, and have no interruption of your fellowship with Him, you need to understand that as soon as you sin, you need to lay hold of God and say, God, forgive me. I claim the blood of Christ. I claim the scripture that you'll cleanse me from all sin. And here's what happens. God puts you right back on the spiritual level where you belong. Where you belong. Whether you accept this or not, it, it, it entirely depends upon you. But I've used it, and here's what happens. I've failed God. I'm a believer. There's sin in my life. What do I do about it? I confess it to God. And when I've confessed that sin... He's God Almighty, God on the throne, who knows my heart, knows the intent of my heart, and I cry out, God, forgive me, and he cleanses me from all sin. Here's what's taking place. You're doing what we call rebounding. I sin, I failed God. What do I do? I confess it, and as soon as I confess it, and this is very important, because as soon as you confess it, God forgives you. God can, God will, and God does forgive you. And you have rebounded. You've hit the bottom, but thank God you bounced right back up. And in so doing, here's a secret. Satan can't get into it. You're free. You're delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you are real intellectual, and you think it's not going to work, and it's a, it's a, it's a gizmo for somebody. I've got news for you. Satan would like you to believe that. That's not true. God will forgive you. God will strengthen you. You'll rebound, and you'll go on for the glory of God. And if you can accept that, you've learned everything you need to learn right now for the word, from the Word of God to get out of here and live for God. But we're going to go into a little more detail, if you will. And we've looked at the believer in sin. And I'm going to leave that to come to the believer and self. We were looking at this last week. And the scripture that I turn to at this particular time is found in the book of 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. For it says, For if we would judge ourselves... We should not be judged. I'm a believer. I have sinned. I've given out to God. Now, there's another phase, another area, another plateau of growth. As a believer in Jesus Christ, I find that there's something God wants me to do. He wants me to judge myself, and I do. I look into my heart, and I find my shortcomings. I may not have an outward sin, but maybe it's a sin of omission, commission, whatever that is. God will bring it to your mind. And as he does this, you are doing something. You're, you have already given that sin to God. The sin life belongs to the Satan. It's over with in your life. It'll be coming up daily, but you get it over with by the blood of Christ. And now as a believer, I want to grow in the Lord. I don't want to stay down here. I don't want to be a spiritual pygmy, if you will. And that's no insult for pygmies. And if there's one amongst us, God bless you. I love you. But uh, we're talking about a, a, an immature walk. And if you want a mature walk with God, you have to have the wonderful release of the Spirit of God in your life where he has absolute control over you. And as you yield to him, give yourself to him, he will do something for you. 
there's a renouncing that I must make in my Christian life. I'm saved, walking with God, but there's another area that I want to get into. I want to be in a closer relationship with God than I've ever been before. And this should be the desire of your heart. If you're born again, you're saved, you're washed in the blood, then you should be desiring to grow in Christ, grow in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Word of God. And in order to do this, you come before God and say, Lord, I, I judge myself and I, I just want to hear. The words I spoke to were very, very bad. I shouldn't have said it. The thought that I had, God, I don't want that kind of a thought. Whatever that area may be, you bring that to God and say, Now, Lord, I want you to reign supreme in my life. Two soldier men, three of them were. Picked them up one time, we were working with servicemen, and the three of these men decided they were going to get up before Reveille. And they were going to have time where the three of them got together and prayed. Well, you know, many years have gone by since these men made that decision for Christ. They wanted to grow in the Lord. All three of them are succeeding in their Christian walk with God. One of them I received a letter from yesterday, turned out to be a pastor. He pastored in the church, and he retired. And he's written two books. He wrote a new one just recently, and he wrote me a letter and let me know that I'm still on a firing line for Jesus Christ. But I remember going back in those years where he started, and I remember remember how that these three men were on fire for God, young men, young men, and they, and they really, really, truly gave their heart to Christ, and they, they wanted to have a Christ life. They wanted Christ to control their life. And as a result of that, the years have gone by, and they have been used of God, one in particular, in a very, very mighty, powerful way, as a pastor handling the Word of God. Received a letter the other day, and you know, letters excite me, especially when they're nice letters. Got a nice letter. I've gotten some when I've been on the radio that, 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 that people had written it with such vehement madness, if you will, that you could read. The, it was like Braille when he wrote into that letter. I don't like your preaching, you know, and I got it in the mail. I could just about feel it. And uh, I always put those on under my knees, pray over and say, God, you, you take care of them. I can't. I don't know who they are, and I don't care to know. But uh, as, we, as we see God working in our life, we, we yield to him. And this, this letter came the other day, and I, I, I needed it at that time. Opened it up, and as I read that letter, I just was thrilled in my heart. A young girl, 20 years of age, had fallen into sin, was deep, deep, deeply caught in drugs for several years. And I talked with her and ministered to her and to no avail. But uh, she wrote me a letter the other day, and in the letter she said, I have returned to God. I've been dry, clean for five months. And she says, and I remember you telling me that I'd pay a price for living this life. She says, you were right. But she says, Pastor, I don't remember this, but my mom and dad kept telling me they dedicated me. You prayed for me. You dedicated me and my mom and daddy to the Lord that they would raise me right. And she says, it paid off after, after these years. She's 20 years old now. She's free by the grace of God. Again and again, you see, the power of the word of God. When we, when, we, when we are serving God, you have to realize God is on the move and God is doing things in the lives of men and women that, that maybe you don't see for years. And then all of a sudden it comes out and God gets the glory Amen. because there's something marvelous in their life. And if I were seated here now, if I were listening, and if I were hooked on drugs, hooked on liquor, whatever it may be, uh, whatever sin it is that's besetting you, with, and you are not in Christ, give your heart to Christ. Yeah. He'll clean you up and get you started and get you right on the right road right away, and it can happen for you. So when I talk about renouncing myself, I'm judging myself, and I'm denying myself, and I'm looking at the Word of God for direction. Romans says, I gave you this verse last week. Let me give it to you again in case you didn't listen. The Bible says this, Paul, you all, when you think of Paul, what do you think of? You think of a warrior. You think of a mighty man of God. You think of a man that's flawless and peerless in his life. But you know, he had a problem, just like some of you may have right now. He was thinking about this spiritual life, and he was realizing that sometimes he couldn't live that life the way he should. And so God inspired him to pen these words in the book of Romans, the seventh chapter. And verse 18, he says this, Paul's writing, 
For he says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Do you realize that? There's nothing good in you. Paul says, I realize that. But he had a dilemma, had a problem. He answers it in the next chapter. But here's what he says at this stage. For lo, uh, I want to do the will is present with me, but how to perform that? How to, to do the right thing all of the time? And how to, how to perform that which is good? I, I find not. He had a hard problem. And in the next chapter, he learned that he had to yield his life and his members unto God as members of righteousness. And he realized that he had to have an exchange life. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I have problems. But the sooner I get into this area where that I allow myself to be led by the Holy Spirit of God, I yield to the Spirit of God, I go forward with him, I'm blessed of God. When you are in a wrestling match, and sometimes you'll get in a hold on your opponent, and he'll give up because he's hurting. He's hurting. He's hurting. And so you just give up the fight. My son, when he was in, uh, Bob Jones, was in a wrestling match. He volunteered for it. He never saw his opponent. opponent. When he went into the ring, his opponent came in. He was as big as he is. But at that time, he was not that big. And he says he got into a wrestling match, and I got just laid on top of him. And he says, all I could do is push, him, push the, the flab away so I could breathe. And he says, I surrendered. <laughs> he says, when he went back into the dormitory, his buddies had gotten together and they made a great big red badge, and they called it Badge of Courage, and they put it on his door. Now, you may want a Badge of Courage. I don't know, but I'm just saying you're, you're in a wrestling match with Satan. He wants to put you down. He wants to get you down for the count. God says, i got something for you to do. I've got a plan for you. So we look at this verse, and I'm going to take you to Mark chapter 8. Turn over there, will you please? And I want you to know this verse 34, and I want you to see this with your eyes, and follow me carefully as you turn in your Bible. And here I'm at Mark's Gospel, and I'm in the 8th chapter. I'm going to read verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, now listen very carefully, these are words of direction for you as well as anybody in the day it was written. He said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. My friend, there has to be a day and a time in your life when you decide to follow Jesus Christ. And there has to be a time in your life if you really want to grow in the Lord Jesus where you begin to deny yourself. Now, there's a lot of false concepts about denial, that doesn't do anything for your salvation. It doesn't do anything for you, but it obeys God, and God in turn blesses you. So he says, let him do this. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. It doesn't mean that we have to get a great big wooden cross like this one gentleman did. That was his call, not mine. And put that wooden cross on you and take it and drag it around with you wherever you go. That's not what God is saying. He's saying that you who are now my child, you have believed on me, you are want to follow me, then there's some things that have to take place in your life. Has this happened in your life? Have you ever come to a stage where you've said, God, there's something here for, for me from the world, the world is offering it to me, but I know if I take that, if I do that, I'm going to miss the blessings of God and turn God Give me strength to deny that thing in my life. I don't want to have anything come in between me and God. Do you live like that? You should. And this is exactly what he's saying here. And when you take up the cross of Jesus Christ, you follow him. You don't look to the right. You don't look to the left. You keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on the Savior and keep going straight towards the cross. There's your deliverance, my friend. And he says there's got to become a denial. Next we find in verse 35... And this is practical teaching, the best teaching you'll get because it's God's Word. I have spent my life preaching, and I have made a study to be simple in my preaching so that everybody can understand it. I remember what my pastor told me when I was ordained. He says, Earl Johnson, when you get into the pulpit, remember this. The Lord Jesus Christ said this, feed my sheep. 
He said, don't try to feed the giraffes. And so I've always come down from the giraffes. You giraffes can hang around, but I'm going to reach the sheep. If I reach the sheep, I'm reaching the heart of those that are going to come to Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and preaching, I've, I've led doctors to the Lord. I've seen lawyers come to Jesus Christ. I've seen poor men, rich men, beggars, thieves, the whole, whole lot of them there. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he says here, if you're going to follow me, here's what you need to do. For verse 35, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Now follow that carefully. He's using a, a spiritual illustration for you. You have a life. You have a life to live. Now look very carefully. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. If you get your life and give it to the world, say you want to become a great musician and you put your whole life in practicing that, machine, that, that whatever it is, and, and you succeed, you may have succeeded in life, but have you done anything for God? I heard a man last night on a Billy Graham message in the 1990s, the man was a sports uh, the leader. I don't even know his name, but he was a, evidently a great man. And he said this, he says, I lead, but until I gave my heart to Jesus Christ, I didn't know how to lead. And he said, I've learned this. He says, I've given my life to Jesus Christ first and the football secondly. I think that's a decision that a man made, and he was successful because of that. And he says this, if he... But whosoever shall lose his life, now there's a paradox, save your life, lose your life. I'm a child of God, I want to follow the Lord Jesus, and the Bible says to me as I listen to the Holy Scripture, I need to take up my cross and follow him, I need to deny myself, and as I deny myself, God does something inwardly for me that couldn't happen any other way. He works on the inside, he works on the inner man, he does something inside of me, and he can do the same, and he does the same for every believer here today. How many of you believe that same man? Amen. All right, if we believe it, the next question is this. Are we practicing it? Are we practicing it? Notice this. He says, for my sake, lose your life for his sake, and the Gospels, that man, uh, the Bible says, the same shall save it. So I have a life. What a beautiful present time my life. And this life now, in 49, 1949, I gave it wholly to Christ. And all these years I've had many failures. I, I don't want to even talk about it. I've had many failures, but there's been a slow, progressive growth in Christ. And that should be your life and my life together. We're growing progressively in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus as we study the Word, as we're led by the Spirit of God, as we serve Him, and as we go forward, and we're losing our life. I remember on one evening, my former ministry, my, every weekend I traveled somewhere in Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, I closed the service down at, at seven at, at, on Saturday. And when the service was over, we dealt with men, and then I, I got in my car and I drove to a church way up in Pennsylvania. I drove all night long. When I got up there, I needed a shave. I went into, I couldn't afford a motel, so I went into a Salvation Army. He said, can I shave? <laughs> he said, who are you? He said, I'm a preacher. And you're coming here to get a shave? I said, I've got no other place to go. He said, come on in, buddy. And they gave me the stuff. I shaved, got all dressed up, went into church. I walked in there and I had a great day. We, we preached in the Sunday school, preached in the morning service. Then in the afternoon, somebody says, we're having a jail service preacher. Would you come and preach for us? I said, yeah, I'll come with you. I preached in the jail service, had a great time, came back and preached in the evening service, and I had a wonderful time in the Word of God. And that was getting late. I hadn't, I hadn't slept all night, and here I was going, and, and uh, uh, the service was over, and a fellow said, I'll take you to the highway so you can find your way out of here. And he said, you'll get lost if I don't. I said, okay, he did. He drove me to a junction, and he got out of his car, and he came over to me, and I rolled down my window, and he leaned over and he said to me, Preacher, is it necessary for you to do what you did today? I looked at him, and uh, I didn't know what to say. I drove away, and I was thinking about that. Is it necessary for you to give yourself up a little bit of time to, to get tired, to get worn out, and... And to keep on preaching, keep on preaching like the, like the, like the energized buzzing, energized buzzing, energized 
funny. You've got it together. And, and I, is it worth it all? And I remember going into my house, and the light, the, the, the dawn was just coming up. I remember walking through the yard, and I heard birds singing. Uh, I said, good morning, birds. How are you? I had a good time, didn't I? And then I thought to myself, oh, yeah, it's worth it all. It's worth it all. I can't tell you how many nights I have done that, how many weekends I've taken off and my family, my, my wife would stay with the children. I drive all by myself. I drive out and be alone. And I don't like to be alone. I like to be with my family. But, but it was important that we get the gospel out. And listen to me carefully. You who know me, you who have been to church as long as you have, you've only seen half of me. There's another half of my life you don't know anything about. And I want to assure you this, and my wife will tell you this. I have been going on and 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 on, and I'm not about to quit. You know why? It's really worth it all. And I want to tell you something. I am the most blessed man in this building. I will put my life up to yours and show you God's uh, he's powered blessing after blessing on me. I'm not the smartest man in the world. I'm not the swiftest man in the world. I'm not the most educated man in the world. But I love Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed of him, and I'll preach until God takes me home. Not without out of the way. Let me go on with you. Verse 36, the Bible says, For what shall a prophet of man if he gain the whole world? You think of that for a minute. You see the ads on TV? Watch football and win a million dollars. You know your chance in winning that million dollars? Forget it. But your mind says, I'd like that million dollars. God says, you're a believer. Don't worry about the money deal. I'll take care of that. He says, if you gain the whole world, you've got nothing to lose because you're saved, secure, and you're going to go to heaven. But the unsaved man, you can gain barns, built the barns and it was, what does it profit him this night? Thy soul shall be required of thee, Mr., Mrs., young person, old person, whoever you are. You have absolutely no assurance of another day to be alive. You need to lose your life in Christ. To be found in Christ when you go home is going to be the greatest blessing you've ever had in your life. For what shall it profit a man? He shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Now that soul is important. It's mentioned again, if you'll notice with me please, in the next verse. Read it out loud. Verse 37. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Stop there for a minute. You may be a successful businessman. You may have made it in the world. You may have everything that your heart could desire for. There's nothing more you need. Everything is there. You've got 14 cars and all the rest of it, you know. I heard of one man that wanted to have one car of every kind that's ever been made, and he bought a farm and bought car after car after car. But guess what? He died. Who's going to drive those cars? He isn't driving them anymore. I want to, there's, a, there's a funeral home, out, a, a cemetery out here, where they have a man buried... And on top of his tombstone, he has, a, and this, you can see it, it has a table and men sitting around it gambling. And this was his, his mark. He was a gambler. He gained nothing but eternity apart from God. You say, preacher, what keeps you going? You, who are without Jesus Christ. You who are not growing in the Lord. You're the one I live for. Paul said the same thing. He said, I live for this, the Christ would be formed in you. We got a young preacher down here, Jerry Harmon. Do you know there was a day in his life when he wasn't a preacher? I remember when he got saved, just a teenager. He was as ugly then as he is now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. But the one thing I noticed, we had our Christian school. And he and his brother and a whole bunch of guys were involved in that in our church. And I remembered uh, 
watching you. You probably don't know it. I watched him many times. When breaks would come, he'd whip out his Bible as a young teenager. He'd take that Bible and start reading it. And I'd watch him, look at him, and he wasn't faking. He loved the Word of God. You want to know something? He was losing his life. Years have gone by. That's why he can preach the way he does today. You can't do it any other way. It took a lot for any of these preachers, Earl, anyone. It took a lot to get in that position where you're called to preach. But it's losing your life, losing your life, losing your life. You know, I, I don't want I don't want to bore you, but I have to share this with you. You remember a young fellow that came here? He was a baseball player, big tall guy. Remember his name, Pat Kelly? Who did he play for the Orioles, I think, one time? He gave his heart to Christ after he was in the sports and became an evangelist. He lived right around this area. Many times he'd come into my office on a regular basis. Preacher, you got any material I can preach from? He didn't have any formal study. And I'd give him a little bit of this or that, or a little humbly give him something he could use. And, uh, and he would come in, and every time he'd come through that door, he'd say, Preacher, great big guy, handsome guy. He'd put his hand up and say, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. I want to tell you what kind of man he was. He was in his 60s. He was preaching in Philadelphia. Some of you don't know this. And as a result of that, he had a heart attack. I think it was a stress, the strain on the highway. A young black couple stopped. They came over to him and said, can we help you? He says, call the 911, will you? Well, that ends another service here at Grace Bible Baptist Church. For those of you who are listening for the very, very first time, we want you to know that this program is bought with a caring heart. We care about you. We want you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to know the Word of God, how that you can live and walk with Him and have an inner beauty and an inner rest that only God can give to you. Well, you must come and visit us at our church, 1518 North Rolling Road, right here in Catonsville, Maryland. You still have time to make the service. Now, you'll find a number at the end of the screen. Give us a call. We're there to help you. God bless you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you every Sunday.